Hi, I, I want to pick up on yesterday's topic about uh, the whole great debate in national security, where we are and where we need to go. And I want to use as part of it a letter written by a number of former national security officials, many of whom I know personally, very smart people. Uh, I don't in any way discount their IQ uh, or their commitment to the country. Uh, but I disagree, and I find fascinating some of what they wrote. These are, this is a long letter about why they will not vote for Donald Trump. Now, I just want to start by saying um, I think there are a lot of things you can criticize about Donald Trump, and I think that uh, in some ways he represents an enormous break, uh, both in personality, because he's a businessman, not a politician, uh, and in uh, his approach to things, because he takes a much tougher view of America's national security performance over the last uh, 10 or 15 years than would the officials who were part of that performance. So in that sense, I understand their critique. But, but in the real world, you only come down to choices. Uh, the choice is not Donald Trump or General Dwight David Eisenhower, who went from being the commander of allied powers in Europe to being president of the United States. Uh, he's clearly the most experienced and sophisticated national security president in modern times. Uh, the choice is not uh, between Donald Trump and Ronald Reagan, somebody who had been thinking about communism since 1947 and who entered, public, uh, entered the presidency uh, after 33 years of thought with a very clear strategy of what he wanted to accomplish and a willingness to organize the government to accomplish it. If you said to me, would I trust Eisenhower more than Trump, I'd say, sure. If you said to me, would I trust uh, Ronald Reagan more than Trump, I'd say, absolutely. But that's not the choice. And that's why I am puzzled by a number of my Republican friends who suddenly have found Trump unacceptable and then don't particularly want to describe the alternative, which is Hillary Clinton. So let me, let me give you an example of, of uh, language that I find, frankly, would be funny if it weren't so serious. They say, most, I'm quoting from their letter, most fundamentally, Mr. Trump lacks the character, values, and experience to be president. Let me take each of those one at a time. Character. Uh, two weeks ago, we watched Hillary Clinton on Chris Wallace uh, on Fox News Sunday lie about lying. We know that she has been lying about her emails for over a year. We know that she has been lying about lying about the emails for the last couple of months. Uh, we know that every week we find out new things. Uh, we know that uh, the 33,000 emails that she deleted, which was illegal, uh, almost certainly now contain a variety of information about uh, deals done for the Clinton Foundation. Just in the last 24 hours, we've had a whole new wave of emails that show deals being done for a Lebanese-Nigerian billionaire, for example. Deals being done for a Russian billionaire. Deal, I mean, the use of the State Department on behalf of the Clinton Foundation to enrich Bill and Hillary Clinton. That's what it comes down to. Now, we know this. So my good friends who are worried about, uh, to use their word, character, I would ask them, how, how can you possibly suggest that on the grounds of character, Hillary Clinton is a more trustworthy president? In the sense, you can say you, you can guarantee she'll be corrupt from day one. You can guarantee that our foreign opponents will know who they need to bribe, namely Bill and the Clinton Foundation. Uh, she'll be efficiently corrupt. I mean, the idea of comparing character and concluding that it's Trump and not Hillary who is automatically excluded from the presidency, I think requires a great deal of um, deception, self-deception, by some very smart people. Second, they talk about values. Here's a, a big core distinction. <clears throat> you say, well, Donald Trump doesn't know a lot. Well, he does know that the people who are killing us are radical Islamists. He does know that uh, Islamic supremacism is a worldwide movement. He does know that there are uh, real efforts by ISIS to send people in the U.S. to kill us uh, using Syrian refugees as a baseline. He does know that uh, Libya under Hillary was a disaster. Syria under Hillary was a disaster. Iraq under Hillary was a disaster. Afghanistan is increasingly a disaster. Pakistan is decaying. Somalia is a disaster. Yemen is a disaster. 
He knows all these things. He knows that uh, Hillary was backing the wrong side in Egypt, the anti-American Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Islamic radicals. Uh, so in that sense, I would say, gee, on, on the, I'm sure he doesn't know the 647 little things that Hillary memorized uh, as, a, as a really good uh, you know, student at, at, at Wellesley and Yale. She learned how to do lots of memorization. But she didn't, have, she didn't learn how to do much reality. Uh, and so you can start with the idea that on the really big questions, he may in fact be smarter than she is. Now, some of this is a matter, and this is where I wish my friends in national security who aren't happy with Trump would talk more about, let's have a policy debate. They're clearly rattled because he's willing to consider dealing with Putin. Well, the question that he asked and I, that I would ask as somebody who's studied this a long time, uh, what's the alternative? Hillary tried this reset. Go back and look at the proud video, which I, I've used before on TV shows. Here's Hillary meeting with the Russian foreign minister to reset our relationship, because it's going to be better than it was under George W. Bush. And all of you know, because I, I think it's such an amazingly funny story and tells you a lot about how incompetent Hillary is. Uh, they had decided at the last minute at their hotel in Geneva that they would get a button out of uh, the, the whirlpool, the hot tub in the hotel. They pulled out this red button. They got their interpreter to paint reset on it in Russian. And Hillary was going to be quite clever, except for a mistake. The interpreter got the word wrong. And he wrote overcharge. And the Russian foreign minister looks at this, you know, what, what is a hotel whirlpool button? And he looks at it and he says, no, we're not going to let you overcharge us. Now, that was sort of captured for me, this whole idea of Hillary's knowledge and, and Hillary's experiences. And I would, I would ask my good friends who are in national security who are telling us that they trust Hillary more, which part do you trust, Benghazi? Do you trust her judgment about Libya, which turned into a disaster? Do you, I mean, where, do you trust her achievement with Putin, which was negative? And if, she, if you don't think that Trump should try to reach out to Putin, what's your strategy? You think you're going to go to war over Crimea? Or are we just going to watch passively while President Erdogan establishing an authoritarian dictatorship in Turkey comes closer and closer to Putin because neither of them like democracies? Both of them understand a strongman authoritarian system. And so the question is, what would Hillary's strategy be? Eight more years of the same thing with Obama, which has been a failure? Uh, they go on to say, that um, he's opposed to religious tolerance. There's no evidence of that. Uh, he is concerned about a wing of Islamic radicalism, which is killing people. Uh, it just killed 60 lawyers in Pakistan. Uh, it killed people in Bangladesh in, in a local restaurant. Uh, it killed 84 people in Nice with a truck. Um, it killed people in Orlando. So that's not religious intolerance. I would argue that the unwillingness of our national authorities, including many of the people who signed this letter, to be honest about the scale and the size of the threat is a much greater dereliction of duty than anything they're worried about with Donald Trump. And, and let me point out, once you start down the road of lying, and we know, for example, that the Obama administration, including Hillary Clinton, deliberately, consciously lied about Benghazi, that for re-election reasons, uh, Barack Obama did not want to admit that our enemies were strong enough, that the terrorists were strong enough uh, to attack us in Benghazi. And so rather than say this was a planned terrorist operation, which they knew it was, and they said so to the Egyptian president, they said so to the Libyan foreign minister, Hillary said so in an email sent to her daughter. They knew it was a planned terrorist operation. Instead of that, they lied about it. They blamed it on some stupid movie. And the poor guy in the United States who made the movie was actually arrested on some tax charge because they wanted to prove to the Muslim world that they were tough on these kind of movies. Now, the consequence of that kind of lying is that it sets a moral rot in the system. The consequence of Hillary lying now for at least two years in public about her emails sets up a moral rot. Uh, there's a famous scene where at the Benghazi hearings, 
she says, whether, whether they were attacked by terrorists or they were attacked because of a film, they're dead. What difference does it make? Well, it makes all the difference in the world. If, if you think this is part of a planned worldwide terrorist movement, you have a totally different response than if you think it was a bunch of, as she put it, some random guys who came by and decided to kill Americans, which she knew as she testified in front of the Congress was a total lie. Now, what happens when you start making that level of dishonesty normal? Well, we're seeing it now in a report which apparently will come out of the uh, House uh, Appropriations Committee that at the Central Command, the people who are fighting the war in the Middle East, that 50 analysts, 5-0, signed a letter saying that they had been pressured to lie about ISIS, that they had been under direct pressure to make ISIS less threatening, less dangerous, less important than it really is. Think about that. When the military starts to be permeated by a moral political corruption to such a degree that these 50 analysts allege that the major general in charge of, of their analysis for the Central Command pressured them to lie. And think about how dangerous that is for the country. You start getting into the habit of having your intelligence systems lie to you about the threat, and you have a huge problem. So when I read uh, their concern about uh, moral authority, their concern about character, their concern about values, or frankly, their concept of experience. I mean, Hillary's had a lot of experience. Most of it's bad. Most of it's failure. Uh, Secretary of State, she was stunningly incompetent. Uh, and, and they're not willing to debate the facts of reality. Instead, they're rendering judgment. You know, the, the, the current defense of the old order, of the establishment, is this concept of temperament. Well, how would you describe temperament, for example, for Andrew Jackson? for Theodore Roosevelt. How would you describe temperament for Harry Truman? Um, I think you gotta look at these things and say, you know, it's a, it's a pretty big stretch to try to hide from genuine, authentic, legitimate policy fights by screaming temperament uh, and hoping that you can shrink the other person so you don't have to deal with it. Um, finally, two other things. Uh, they say they say he persistently compliments our adversaries and threatens our allies and friends. They could have written that sentence about Barack Obama. It's not Donald Trump who's paying 150 billion dollars to the Iranian dictatorship, the leading state sponsor of terrorism in the world. It's not Barack Obama who has consistently. I mean, it's not uh, Donald Trump who has consistently undermined Israel and favored its enemies. Uh, I would argue that uh, Barack Obama did a lot uh, to undermine, for example, the, the Mubarak government and almost got us into an Islamist dictatorship in Egypt, which would have been a catastrophic outcome. Uh, I would suggest to you that the entire effort by the Obama administration to strengthen Iran is in fact undermining our allies in Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, Kuwait, Bahrain, uh, and causing great nervousness. Uh, it is not Donald Trump who was in charge when Crimea was retaken by Putin. It wasn't Donald Trump who's in charge as Erdogan uh, migrated away from the secular system that uh, had been developed by Ataturk towards a much more Islamist authoritarian dictator system uh, that he's trying to create. <clears throat> These have all occurred under Barack Obama. So I think it's a little bit much to suggest <coughs> that it's Trump who doesn't understand these things. It's not Trump who went down and legitimized the Castro brothers. Um, so again and again, <coughs> excuse me, what we have is a situation where we, under, we understand that they want to render judgment against Trump. I would just suggest that there are, there are legitimate policy debates we ought to be having and that they ought to come out and say, do they really approve of what Hillary did in Libya? Do they really approve of how the reset with Russia is gone? Do they really think the strategy has been effective with China? Do they really think we've had a positive impact on North Korea, which continues to build nuclear weapons? You just go around the world and you see constant decay under the current foreign policy national security establishment, and they are frightened, and they want to yell temperament because they don't want to defend their record. And we have to have a debate as a country about the nature of reality, 
the nature of what threatens us, and how much we have to reform our systems, starting with the State Department, but also the Department of Defense, the whole intelligence apparatus, and the Department of Homeland Security. The folks who have been running those don't particularly want to have a debate about how inadequate they are, how wrong their strategies are, and how much we have to reform them. So they yell temperament and hide. That's a disservice to America. Let's have an honest debate about this. Uh, Amy Rio says, since our foreign policy is in such obvious disarray and Trump isn't fond of many of the establishment types who he believes helped that disarray, who will he appoint to the hundreds of positions in our State Department to straighten things up? Well, I hope that he will turn to new people. I don't think we need to bring back in the people who have failed. Uh, I think we need to look, uh, in some cases, to people who've done business internationally, to lawyers who have practiced internationally, in some cases to people who've been uh, intellectuals studying this, who've been more accurate in their analysis and their development. I think we can find good people, but we have to recognize it'll be a very difficult, painful, uh, and in some ways angry process, because the old order is not going to go quietly. They're not going to passively say, oh, please, let me resign from my job. You're going to have exactly as happened to Governor Scott Walker in Madison when he came in having campaigned on real reform, and he actually implemented real reform, and he had 100,000 people in the street protesting because they didn't want to change. Well, you're going to see the same thing here. I, I don't think the culture of the Foreign Service, and I have been for over a decade saying we need to overhaul the State Department. This is not something new. This doesn't relate to the Trump campaign. I firmly believe the State Department and its current structure cannot possibly be effective representing America. I think it has to be overhauled. Well, the current Foreign Service is not going to jump up and down and say, oh, that's great. They're going to fight it every inch of the way. So you have to recognize there are a number of real changes. I also think that Obama has uh, really weakened the Defense Department. And you see that uh, with the corruption we're being told about at CENTCOM and the idea that these 50 analysts are being pressured to lie about the nature of ISIS and the strength and danger from ISIS. And that's going to require us to think about very seriously reviewing uh, and reestablishing uh, a reality-based professional military system that isn't permeated by political correctness, uh, which it currently is. Um, Audrey Dalton, has there ever been a candidate who ran for the office of President of the United States in the past history, similar to Hillary, who has been proven to have committed so many criminal acts, but had still been allowed to run for office? I don't know of any candidate in American history as obviously visibly corrupt as Hillary Clinton, as obviously visibly repetitively dishonest as Hillary Clinton, who, as I said earlier, lies about lying. I mean, it's, it's pretty hard to get beyond that. Uh, and you look at the stuff that's coming out from these various emails about, you know, billionaires getting access and major donors being put on nuclear weapons committees about which they have no knowledge. Um, I think you have to say to yourself that, that, that it is astounding that the Democratic Party nominated her and that it would be a disaster for the country uh, if she ended up in the White House. I just, uh, I say that sadly. I mean, I, I think the last 16 years have not been kind to the Clintons. I think that they decayed dramatically after they left the White House. And I, somehow, uh, the availability of so much money went to, got to their heads, and they've engaged in behaviors that are uh, just astonishingly uh, illegal and corrupt and, I think, unsustainable. Roseanne Olen I'm going to probably get this wrong. I think it's Olenichak. Why is Elizabeth Warren's ominous threat to Donald Trump not front page news? Uh, she said she wants him to disappear, a mafia term used that would get Donald Trump days of news coverage. Um, I don't know what she meant by disappear. I mean, if I were Elizabeth Warren, I'd want, I can understand why she'd want him to disappear. I don't think she was suggesting that the uh, Boston mafia uh, go and get him and disappear him. Uh, although I understand that uh, term. And it certainly is odd, you're right, if, if, uh, if Donald Trump had said, uh, I wish uh, that Elizabeth Warren would disappear, there would have been an entire uh, news storm. But that just tells you how totally biased the media is right now. Uh, we are in the most hostile, one-sided, distorted news media in my lifetime. Uh, the desperation of the news media to stop Trump is absolutely astounding. And as a result, he has got to be very careful because any opening he gives them, they will lie about and distort and then try to keep it as page one so that they, they don't let him get his message across because they have him tied up in this kind of minor baloney. 
Michael Alberti, what in your opinion does Trump need to do in the next eight weeks to win the general election? Uh, how big will the outcome of the debates influence the voters to choose our nominee? Uh, I would say that he should consider spending uh, probably a third of his time practicing for the debates. I think the debates are extraordinarily important because people are going to tune in to see whether or not he's really qualified to be president. Hillary's going to go in there with a very well thought out plan to get under his skin, to anger him, to get him rattled, uh, and to uh, try to get him to do something that proves that he has the wrong temperament. Uh, and she's also going to try to get into topics where her knowledge of detail uh, will be dramatically greater than his. Remember, she was, after all, the wife of a governor. She was the wife of a president. Uh, she was an envoy for the United States. She was a senator from New York. She was a secretary of state. So her total detailed knowledge, you know, she couldn't build a building like Donald Trump could. She doesn't know nearly as much as he does about construction, but she knows a lot more about politics than he does. And so she'll try to get him into two things. One, rattle him personally to see if she can get him to respond angrily or off balance. And two, uh, try to prove she knows so much more than he does that he's not qualified to be president. He needs to be prepared to walk in there knowing enough to be absolutely acceptable, which is a challenge Reagan had in 1980. And he needs to walk in there calmly, having already had his own team throw everything at him. Then they need to rattle him in private so we can learn how to deal with it, not walk into that first debate and get rattled in public. I think it's a very important thing. I think if Trump makes this campaign um, about big things, that it is very likely he will win. If he, if he makes clear, it's not just that Hillary's a liar. Hillary is, in fact, the tip of the iceberg. She is the natural candidate of an establishment that is decaying, uh, an establishment that um, has 5% of the students in uh, Detroit schools reading in the fourth grade, an establishment that has 13% of the students in Baltimore passing their math test in the eighth grade, an establishment that has failed to act when over 3,400 people are killed in Chicago, including nine this last Monday. Uh, more people have been killed in Chicago, more Americans have been killed in Chicago under Barack Obama than in Iraq and Afghanistan. And yet, Clinton and Obama have no solution and pay no attention. And I think you have to look at this and realize that uh, if he makes it a big enough issue that the odds are very high he's going to win uh, because the country is not going to stand for the, uh, the level of failure and they're not going to reward the level of failure that Hillary Clinton represents and that the system that she's the candidate of represents. Um, one last thing, uh, Kelly, Frans I guess it's Francoeur, um, ask, uh, please inform us as to how we make a demand of our Department of Justice to investigate and prosecute the Hillary Clinton. Uh, I think it is disturbing that the FBI ask to be allowed to investigate corruption in the Clinton Foundation that was turned down by the Justice Department. My advice is that you call, don't write call, the office of your congressmen and senators and demand that they set up congressional investigations beginning right after Labor Day, as soon as Congress comes back, to find out how could justice turn down what we now see every day with new emails, new information coming out, is a cesspool of corruption at the State Department in which Hillary Clinton and her staff were selling access and making huge amounts of money for Hillary and Bill. And I think if you call your congressmen and your senators, you're going to get some action. So we'll continue talking about these ideas. Uh, those of you who want to follow us some more, if you go to GingrichProductions.com, uh, we do two free newsletters a week that you can sign up for. Uh, and we also list there all of our movies and books and all the many things Calista and I are doing. So thank you for spending some time with us today.